was longest conflict actually in fact in the world perhaps the changes taking place in Arab the Middle East could provide a window of opportunity for change in this Palestinian cause. And I'm very honored today to have someone who has been such a staunch supporter of the Palestinian cause. And I would like to thank Mr. George Galloway. He is the founder of Viva Palestina in the United Kingdom. And you, are, you have been in Malaysia for a couple of times, but you were in Indonesia earlier for a very specific purpose. Could you just share us on what is your objective uh, this time well, around? We're spreading this uh, idea of Viva Palestina around the world. Uh, because we think that the time for words is past and the action speaks louder than words. So we have been breaking the siege on the Gaza Strip where two million Palestinians live in indescribable conditions, not just in desperate poverty, 80% of them unemployed, 80% of them earning less than a dollar a day, 80% of their children either malnourished or undernourished, but regularly bombed from land, sea, and air, and the gates locked so that they can't escape. Uh, it's one of the most densely populated parts of the world. It's been under siege for the last four years to punish the people, actually, for having voted in a democratic election for a party that Britain and America and the, the Israelis don't uh, like. And we think that it's immoral to starve people's children because you don't like how their parents voted in an election. So. We decided to break this siege, and uh, the first Viva Palestina convoy was an epic uh, journey uh, through many countries, thousands of miles, and a great deal of uh, blood. Fifty-five of our number were hospitalized, several were imprisoned, because then the Arab countries were ruled by dictators, which are now falling one yes. after the other. So our next convoy, which comes up uh, very soon, uh, should receive a much warmer and smoother uh, welcome because the governments in the Arab countries concerned have uh, changed. So Viva Palestina has now spread to 16 countries, the latest of which was Viva Palestina Indonesia, which we formed in the last week. Um, Viva Palestina Malaysia was formed a long time ago, one of the first to be formed, and is a model actually for this whole region um, but we're hoping that uh, a bit of healthy competition friendly rivalry between Indonesia and Malaysia as to who can do most for Palestine I think that would be a good thing now let's just take a look at 2011 the year of the protesters the year of Arab Spring do you foresee this as an opportunity a phase for peace in Middle East in regards to the Palestinian issue or do you see that this might lead to more confrontations and war. Well, Zhou Enlai, the Chinese uh, leader, when asked in 1979 what he thought of the significance of the French Revolution of 1789, said it's too early to say. Right. Uh, so it's definitely too early to say what the impact of the Arab revolutions of last year, none of which are finished yet, yes. actually, will have on the Palestinian situation. But it's hard to see how the situation could be worse because the Palestinians were surrounded by Arab dictatorships who were collaborating either openly or covertly with the Israeli occupier. Now that there is democracy in these Arab countries one by one, no Arab government can openly collaborate with Israel and none can betray openly the Palestinian cause. So it's hard to see that it will not be an improvement of course, it doesn't mean that Palestine is going to be free. It definitely doesn't mean there's going to be war between the surrounding Arab countries and Israel. I think the time for war has mm -hmm. long passed, but there will be now an Arab factor in the equation, in the balance of power that wasn't there before. And that can only strengthen the Palestinians. It can only weaken uh, Israel. And uh, that will in turn encourage Western countries, without whose support Israel couldn't exist, of course, uh, to reevaluate the value to them mm -hmm. of continuing to support this small apartheid state on the Mediterranean. I want to bring this from Obama's perspective, mm. Obama's administration. 
They know that refusal to engage with the political Islam will isolate them completely from the Arab world, and that is what you mentioned, striking a balance, maneuvering. So where do we go from here now? What do you think Obama and his people will do, and what are their strategy next? Well, I'm hoping very much for a second term uh, from oh. President Obama, not least because taking one look at his Republican alternatives <laughs> is enough to make you run for the hills. Um, and in any case, a second term, when no third term is possible, will allow President Obama to really be himself, I hope. And I know that he knows the truth about Palestine, because I know the people who taught him it. Um, and therefore, I have some hopes, I must say it's not shared by everyone, uh, that uh, a second term Obama administration will see the implementation of some of the fine words that he said in Cairo not long mm -hmm. after his inauguration, uh, the fine words that he used to say and believe in about, about the Middle East. But we can't be sure about it. What we know, because it was overheard on tape recordings of the conversation between Obama and President Sarkozy of France in Cannes at the G20 meeting just a couple of months ago, Sarkozy says to Obama, and this is all on tape, I can't look at this Netanyahu's face. He's such a liar. And Obama says, you can't look at his face. I have to deal with this guy every day. So it's comforting to know that the leaders of France and the United States mm. agree with me about Netanyahu. Uh, the task now is to get them to act like it, not just say it in private. But there is also the pressure from the Jewish lobbyists, who of course, supplies a lot of money, to, especially with the U.S. general elections coming in. How do you see that? Well, actually, position? it's not a Jewish lobby, but it is an Israeli lobby. Israel um, most of the supporters of Israel in the United States are, in fact, fundamentalist evangelical Christians. Mm -hmm who support Israel. They don't like Jews very much, by the way. They don't share the, their golf clubs uh, with many <laughs> Jews. Uh, but they love Israel um, because they want to bring the end of the world uh, quicker. Um, it's a very perverse view of the scripture. It's certainly not the Bible as I remember it. But uh, this lobby, this very powerful pro-Israel lobby, is undoubtedly a major factor in this. Because if the United States was acting rationally, it would long ago have ceased to write these blank checks to a tiny country which caused the United States so much trouble throughout the world. General Petraeus, the leading soldier in the United States, uh, told the Armed Services Committee of the U.S. Senate that uh, the U.S. relationship with Israel has now become a strategic liability. Mm -hmm. It had been an asset, but it was now a strategic liability. And the roof didn't fall in, you know, the sky didn't fall down upon him because everybody knows actually that that's the truth. Yeah. Slowly, slowly, we're, I think, beginning to make progress in the United States, a little bit of progress here and there in Europe. But you know, it's in the Muslim world that the answer to this problem really lies. Because, to quote another Chinese statement, statesman, uh, uh, Chairman Mao said that the Muslims are not serious, because if they were serious, they would all walk into Palestine and take it back. There's 1.7 billion Muslims in the world, including the world's richest countries, and there's seven million citizens of Israel. So you can do the maths. Um, I believe that if all the Muslims in the world alone, leave aside everybody else, if they alone with their obligation to do so, acted positively towards the Palestinians and negatively towards the Israelis boycotting Israeli product, but there are many emblematic companies uh, who I mean, a cigarette company, which shall be nameless, alone, which is being smoked by everybody I see here in Kuala Lumpur, including Muslims, gave $1.6 billion last year to Israel. So every puff of one of his cigarettes is, is his money going to Israel to kill Palestinian children. Okay. So there's a lot of work still to be done here in this part of the world. Okay, I will have to go to the first commercial break, but do stay with us. We'll be back shortly. Welcome back. This is Vantage Point, and I have with me George Galway, founder of Viva Palestina. Now, let's talk about the Muslim Brotherhood. We know that they are within reach of an outright majority in the Egyptian parliament. And how do you see the new parliament being led by the Brotherhood in regards to the Palestinian cause and 
especially in Gaza? Well, first of all, the Muslim Brotherhood is not monolithic, neither in Egypt nor throughout the Muslim world. There are many different kinds of Muslim Brotherhood. The Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood is a very mature, experienced, wise and moderate trend. Just like the government of Turkey, which is one of the best governments anywhere in the Muslim world. Uh, they're not the Taliban, they're not Al-Qaeda, uh, they are Islamic people, sincere, clean, moderate. moderate and wise. And I think that the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt are handling the transition from dictatorship to democracy very well indeed and I, I wish them every success and I hope that one of their number is elected uh, president uh, in, in due course. There is absolutely nothing for anybody to fear from uh, organizations like the Muslim Brotherhood. But those who have refused to deal with them, refused to talk with them, and who have I tried to isolate them and supported the repression of them, are of course merely fanning the flames of much more extreme Islamist tendencies. And that's now partly happened in Egypt, because although the Muslim Brotherhood won the election, the number two party was the Salafist, uh, more extreme uh, Islamist uh, trend, and they got 23% of the vote from absolutely nowhere. I consider myself an expert on Egypt, but uh, if you told me they'd get 23%, I'd have said you were joking. Um, so that's 65% or so of the Egyptian parliament is now, uh, the seats are now held by the two main Islamic organizations and I don't think anybody has anything to fear from that in fact the fear is from the refusal to accept that uh, political Islam is here to stay people have to deal with it and the days when you could support any tin pot dictator to crush it are gone for good I would like to quote this uh, interview from the Hamas deputy foreign minister Ghazi Hamad who told the national public radio in the United States he said that the Hamas will accept a two-state solution that respects the 1967 borders. It seems that they are mellowing down on their stance. But at the same time, there are many Palestinians, outside Palestine, who are against this two-state solution. What do you Including think is the best? Including me. Uh, okay. um, I'm against it uh, for two reasons. One, that I don't believe that it's ever going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I was a supporter of the Oslo peace process. I was close to the late President Arafat for many, many years and was with him when he died in Paris a few years ago. And I supported the uh, two-state solution. Why? But it's gone now because I believed that that was the best that we could get given the balance of force in the world. The socialist countries had disappeared. There was no Arab factor and Israel had all the cards. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's not the case any longer. First of all, the Arab world is changing. Uh, the demography, the technology, the political science is all changing in the favor of the Palestinian side and against the Israeli side. Um, the birth rate of Palestinians is the highest in the world. Uh, so Israel can't kill its way out of this, uh, this problem. Um, I believe that a tiny piece of land now completely festooned with illegal settlements, which Illegal settlements can give the wrong impression. We're not talking about log cabins. These are cities called settlements. They're not going to be knocked down. And the physical space in which two states could be carved out of this tiny piece of land is gone. The apartheid wall, the settlements, the separation, physical separation between Gaza and the West Bank, the annexation of Jerusalem, <coughs> which Israel says it's not prepared even to talk about. Without Jerusalem, there is no solution to this. But above all this point, you yourself talked in your excellent introduction about the Palestinian refugees living outside. If you have a two-state solution, <coughs> most of these refugees cannot return, even though it's their legal and moral right to return, because most of them don't come from the West Bank or Gaza. And the West Bank and Gaza is not big enough to take them all. It's only 23% of Palestine. In fact, less if you take out uh, Jerusalem. So I know what Hamas are doing. They're paving the way for the national unity government, the reunification of a much divided polity in the Palestinian arena. They're saying that they don't want to continue a war with Israel. 
and I'm sure that they're right about that. But I think that they'll find that Israel c continues to want a war with them and that Israel will not accept any meaningful two-state solution. So I say let's have a democratic state, one democratic state, just like post-apartheid South Africa, in which the Jews, the Muslims, and the Christians can live as equal citizens under the law. One man, one woman, one vote, one government. What's wrong with that? It's good enough for everybody else in the world. Why shouldn't it be good enough for them? You've been in Palestine. You've been in, um, previously in Israel. Many times, yeah. What do the people there want? <coughs> I mean, do they want a one-state solution or a two-state solution? What is the reading on ground? I would say that the Palestinians living inside, therefore under occupation or siege or annexation, would probably be prepared to accept a uh, two-state solution. But the majority of Palestinians live as refugees outside, and they definitely won't, because it means that they're they giving up their houses, their land. I mean, these are people sitting in refugee camps with a key, big iron key. It's the key to the house that their parents left 64 years ago, and it's still She's their house. No, long, no longer well, there. Well, <laughs> in some cases, of course, cities have been built on top of it. Mm. But in many cases, I means a refugee camp called Jenin. From the roofs of your refugee camp, you can see your own house in Haifa, you can see a foreigner living in your house, picking your oranges, playing in your garden while you're living for 64 years in a refugee camp. And these people will never relinquish their right to return. And uh, they have every legal and moral right to return. And only by killing them would Israel be able to stop them, because the inalienable right to return never dies, even if it takes you 500 years you still have the right to go back to your home. Well, we certainly hope that possession. it does not prolong any more this well, issue, but we have to go for the last commercial break, but just stay with us and we'll be back shortly. Hi, you're still watching Vantage Point, and recently the Viva Palestina Malaysia had organized a Kuala Lumpur film festival. It is the first time they have held this, and I would like to say kudos to Viva Palestine Malaysia for bringing it to the mainstream Malaysian. It was indeed uh, very inspiring. I have watched one of the uh, documentaries. And I would like to just uh, maybe gauge how do you think, I mean, movements in Asia, particularly in perhaps um, we don't have such a big voice compared to, to the big voice like the United States, like Europe and Australia. But how do you see this consolidation of movements, NGOs, civil society to put pressure to the international community, especially with the rise of India, Indonesia, and ASEAN as a whole. What do you think? Do you Very think? much so. I mean, I think that uh, you have more of a voice than perhaps you think. Uh, for a start, uh, people want uh, things from you, and they want to sell their things to you. And uh, speaking as an activist in the downfall of the apartheid system in South Africa, it was actually boycott and divestment and sanctions which prepared the way for the victory of the South African people. And uh, I, I hinted earlier that on every street in Kuala Lumpur, and I've no doubt throughout Malaysia, there are lots of products made by companies who give the profits or part of the profits to Israel. There's a lot that civil society can do, positively for the Palestinians and negatively, if you like, against their oppressors. They could come, for example, your viewers, on our next convoy which uh, will, God willing, uh, arrive in Gaza on the 15th of May. Uh, there have been, I think, 22 uh, Malaysians on the uh, convoy, uh, convoys before, 22 vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you can join us. Go to the website and uh, join us. You, you merely fly to Istanbul, buy a truck or a big van, fill it with aid, and come with us with your Malaysian flag flying and you'll go into Gaza and, the, and two million people will want to kiss you. <laughs> it's quite a good thing. Um, uh, whether you're a believer or not, it's a good thing to do. So you can do that. You can support the work of uh, Viva Palestina Malaysia, which is an outstanding example to us all. Um, I'm merely the father of this uh, organization. Uh, it's the mothers who are bringing it up, uh, the women activists in the VPMY are uh, really something to behold, and you can get involved in them, you can join them. How different will this be, this sixth convoy, mm. compared to the 
Well, there'll be no fighting this time. We won't have to fight our way through the forces of uh, these tin pot Arab dictators for the ones, at least in our way, uh, have gone. <laughs> um, so it'll be a red carpet uh, affair uh, compared to previous ones. And uh, if you do come, it'll be something you will never forget. Okay. Now, the Arab uprising in the Middle East, it was something unthinkable, unimaginable, say, the year before. And civil society, non-violent civil, civil movement have proved that this work, this, this could break down the, op the, yes. op yeah, the regime. And of course, the other groundbreaking civil movement is the Global March to Jerusalem. Mm. Is Viva Palestina involved in that as well? Uh, yes, I'm uh, one of the trustees of the Global March to Jerusalem, and uh, it's on the 31st of March. Mm -hmm. It will take place. We'll try to get to the borders of Palestine. I heard there is a significant uh, date it was chosen. It was yes, this is the Day of the Land, mm -hmm. uh, which commemorates the seizure of uh, Palestinian land. started actually inside Israel, this Day of the Land, uh, amongst the Palestinian population living in there, more than a million. Mm -hmm. Palestinians living under Israeli law, never mind the occupied uh, peoples. It's a significant event. We'll be trying to reach the borders of Palestine from the frontline states. The people inside will try to reach the borders to greet us. We'll see how we go on. But there will be events in Kuala Lumpur and elsewhere in Malaysia to commemorate this global march. Not everyone can go there. Uh, so you need to do something uh, here. There's mm -hmm. also the Summer University of Palestine, which takes place every summer in Beirut at the American University of Beirut. And soon, I think, there will be a Winter University of Palestine, which will take place in this region. And the first one will probably be in Bandung in Indonesia. You can even get some shopping in as well <laughs> as visit the historic uh, museum uh, of the great uh, Africa-Asia conference in 1955 there. And uh, we'll move that around this part of the world. And it will be, I think, uh, uh, the catchment area will be the people uh, who live in this area, although I define this area very broadly because I'm including Australia and New Zealand, which I know is a very long way away. So there are lots of things you can do to give your support to Palestine, and there's lots of things you could do to weaken those who murder them, who've stolen their land, who've driven them to the four corners of the earth, where they're hunted from pillar to post, without passports, without papers, without status, living as non-persons in a twilight zone for 64 Please. years, which is, as you very well put, 64 yes. hours of this would be intolerable. 64 years, generation after generation mm -hmm. after generation, is a blot on the moral landscape of humanity and a, sh a mark of shame on those who could have done something about yes. it and didn't. Palestinian cause has been close to Malaysians all these years, more so from the Muslim community, but we have seen changes recently that involve more civil movement, regardless of race, religion, and even nationality on the international forefront. Will this ultimately boils down to the UN, U United States veto in the United Nations Security Council, or do you think the international pressure mm. and international movement could pave way to peace in Definitely. Palestine. The United States was the last country in the world to abandon apartheid South Africa. Britain was the second last. When I entered Parliament, um, I was nearly 25 years a British MP, when I entered Parliament, Mrs. Thatcher used to routinely describe Nelson Mandela as a terrorist. I saw the words coming out of her mouth many times. Nelson Mandela is a terrorist, she used to say. Now, of course, Nelson Mandela is the greatest man uh, on the earth today. He's loved by more people on the earth today than anybody else. Yes. Uh, but the British and the Americans were the last to accept that. It was the worldwide movement of ostracism of apartheid, combined with the struggle inside of the South African people themselves, uh, which many of whom were Jews, by the way. It's very well, a very important point, this. Many of the great leaders of Thank the you. African National Congress were Jews. Jews don't have to be with apartheid. They don't have to be with dictatorship and, and wickedness. There are many Jews with us. This is not against Jews. It's not about Jews. It's about Israel and it's about Zionism. It's about Israeli. It's not about religion. No. It's 
humanitarian yep. humanitarian rights and the basic rights of people t for self-determination and if you would like to catch a documentary or titled Tears of Gaza you still have a chance to do so on 12 February for more information you can log on to viva palestina slash my dot org and thank you so much Josh Kelly for being on the pleasure. show you're an amazing speaker thank you. and definitely hope you can come back to Malaysia soon I hope so. and thank, thank you. you for watching Vantage Point and we'll see you again on the next episode till then goodbye